a personal word today, uh, starting out, my, my birthday is about a month from now, and I will turn 67 years old. Now, that's, that's not a ripe old age, except that I have to say that, that very few of the men on my mother's side of the family uh, live past the age of 63, so I'm feeling like every day I get up I want to spike a football, you know. <laughs> and I'm in pretty good shape uh, for an old fat guy, so. Um, not a ripe old age, but I'm certainly past the point where anybody's going to call me a kid unless they're trying to flatter me, and some of you still try and do that, so I want to be clear. I, I know what you're up to. Uh, it's a respectable age, not ancient, but it's certainly on the downside of what do you want to be when you grow up. Uh, I've certainly pretty much past that point. But it is that time of life when people, you know, begin to ask hard questions and wonder if they've got any gas left in their tank. Is there anything left in the reserve to kind of get you going? And I, I think that that's a good thing today because this psalm, which we did not read, but we're going to, uh, appointed for this day is Psalm 92, and it's really a unique psalm uh, because it kind of speaks to me where I am right now. Let me read it for you. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made us, and that the works of your hands we sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord, how deep are your thoughts. The dullard cannot know this. The stupid will not understand it. Though the wicked may sprout like the grass and evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction, for they are but a season to you, O Lord. You reign forever. Your enemies perish. Evildoers will be scattered, but the righteous will flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the kingdom of God, they will flourish, and even in their old age, they will bear fruit and be full of life. Did you hear that? Helpful concept for those of us who are nearing retirement. Age as a time of growth, not decline. Age as a time of productivity and not diminishment, which is the way we normally think about those things. People in their 70s and 80s and 90s, as the psalmist puts it, full of life, energetic, creative, imaginative, with a deep and profound love for that which they've come to know and revere through their own experience. And oh my God, do we need people like that today. Have you, have you, have you seen what's going on? We need people like that. Garrison Keeler uh, wrote a column here not too long ago, and he's, he's getting up there. He's a respectable age, 78. He wrote a column about aging. This is what he wrote. The world belongs to the young. Old pictures get shelled one day and released the next. Old writers go fallow and people start giving them awards. Old politicians are locked up in think tanks and old pop stars, they play casinos in Vegas. <laughs> We're marching toward the cliff and the middle-aged are pushing us and the young are pushing them. Well, you know, Garrison Keillor is 78. He's still writing. He's still reflecting what I think is an older, deeper, I dare say better wisdom. And then there's John Glenn, who became an astronaut at 77. And George Bush, the elder, who skydived on his 85th birthday. This guy, Mel Brooks, he made people laugh at the age of 93 in Hotel Transylvania number three, played Vlad. Man, that's a funny movie, by the way, since I have small children that made me watch them all and they were really worth your time. And then there's Jimmy Carter, he's 96, fighting pancreatic cancer and still building houses for Habitat for Humanity. He does that in his spare time. <laughs> now you ask him, he'll tell you, he'll even show you the calluses on his hands. That's the way it works in the kingdom of God. The old flourish. In their old age, they bear fruit, full of life. And this, the psalmist says, is the kingdom of God at work in this world. That's what it is. And our gospel lesson for today, it's from Mark. It also speaks about the kingdom of God. Last Thursday night, Pastor Jude and I, who, by the way, is on vacation day, in case you missed her, she's down in South Carolina. We met with our kingdom, or with our vision team. Uh, Krista is leading that up with a bunch of other really good people. We met with T uh, Kairos Representative Tim Johnson to talk about the future, just the beginning. We're, we're not doing it for you. We're going to be doing it with you. But we were talking about how the kingdom of God is seen in this world, how it's seen in this parish was not a hard conversation to have. How about that? I know, you know you're not surprised to hear it. 
But as we were doing that conversation, it was today's gospel lesson that was going through my mind. I hadn't quite finished my sermon yet. So let me read it to you again. The kingdom of God is as if someone should scatter seed and then sleep and rise night and day and the seed sprouts and grows and he does not know how. And the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which when sown is the smallest of all seeds yet grows and becomes the greatest of all bushes and puts forth large branches so even the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. We, we talked about this lesson today in adult Sunday school and, and Doug was saying, that's not my experience of mustard. It's a weed, a little tiny weed. But the seeds are tiny, very tiny. You know, it's a, it's a tree in, in the Middle East. And sometimes the story that Jesus tells us grab our attention because they are about ordinary people doing ordinary things. They are about, you know, farmers planting seeds, shepherds leading sheep, people going to wedding guests, wedding feasts. But their outcomes are always surprising. That's what surprises us. Not the stories themselves, not the, what the stories are about, but how they end up. Now, I think about one of those familiar parables we, we read in here a few weeks back about the shepherd seeking that lost sheep. Now, even a dullard knows, in case you're one of those people in that song we're talking about, even a dullard knows that's not the way a responsible shepherd should work. You don't, you don't in fact, leave 99 sheep behind to fend for themselves while you run out in the wilderness looking for the lost one. The lost one is what you write out, so we call it acceptable losses. Now today there's this farmer. He's just dropping the seeds in the ground and he's going home to sleep all day and all night. And any respectable farmer will tell you that ain't the way it works. You have to weed and fertilize and work the soil and water the soil. The farm won't amount to much if you don't. Thursday night my sister and brother-in-law stopped by to have dinner with us. And as she came in she said, you better water those tomato plants out front. My garden consists of two tomato plants in pods. I'm proud of them. They each have tomato on them, so I'll try that. And my first thing is I protest, but I just watered them this morning. How often are they going to need water, for heaven's sake? And they need a lot of care, she said. And if you want them to live, you better go out and water them right now. <laughs> and I thought, well, I have a problem with a couple of tomato plants that require more attention than I gave at least three of my children. <laughs> Uh, you, my wife will say more about that to me on the way to my mother's house today, trust me, I know. <laughs> so I'm not making eye contact right now because we're... <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. And so this story today about the farmer working in his field when his neighbor, you know, comes by and says, well, my, 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 what a beautiful farm God has blessed you with. You can almost hear him say, hey, you should have seen the place when God was working it without me, you know. But this is Jesus' point, I think. It takes a deep and holy commitment. Because a farmer will tell you that someone somewhere, somehow, sometime has to plant the seed and cultivate it and weed it and water it. Because farming requires commitment. It requires hard work, steady attention, a deep and holy love. It takes a deep and holy trust in the mystery of growth about which the farmer, you and I, do nothing at all but wait and watch and are astonished when it happens. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like that. Because when someone, somewhere, sometimes, somehow plants a seed, God's kingdom comes by some mysterious power. It does not come like a bolt from the blue. It does not come like a volcanic eruption or, in spite of the apocalyptic rantings of some people today, it does not come like a violent, vengeful cataclysm. It comes like a seed dropped in the ground growing and bearing fruit. It comes like a teacher who sits with a student and patiently teaches them English in our English as a second language class. Or another teacher sitting with our GED classes and teaching them math and grammar. And wondering, I know when they do it, if the seed they're planting is ever gonna bear fruit. It's like a group of church people going to Tanzania to paint a hospital or raise money to build a pediatric wing, wondering if it's ever gonna do any good if the seed's ever going to grow and germinate. It's like the Sunday school teachers who were here earlier today, dealing with little ones and loving them and wondering if the seeds that they plant are ever going to bear any fruit, or a school teacher who stays after hours with a difficult student struggling with math or science to help them through, 
or a mother who sees more in her child than anyone else can and never gives up. Seed planters, all of them. And sometimes that seed planted in the human heart is the dream of a better world. And that seed also mysteriously takes root and grows and stubbornly refuses to die even in the face of overwhelming odds from pundits and politicians who fear that the common person just might own their own problems and solve them. Sometimes it takes root and grows in the life of a person who hears the call and says, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I will do that. I will work for kindness in this world. I will live at peace with my neighbor. It's a fragile dream, I'll grant you. A tiny seed that must contend in this world with seeds of hatred and bigotry and violence which also take root and grow and bear a terrible poisonous fruit. But Jesus says the kingdom of God is like that. It grows in the midst of that. There are lots of images of the kingdom of God bearing fruit, but one came to mind last Thursday night as I was listening to our people talk. A powerful image for me from 10, 10 years ago, actually, when the Chancellor of Germany and the President of the United States spoke about peace outside a place called Buchenwald, a place that represents the most monstrous evil of human history. On that day, President Obama recalled the story of Jewish adults at Buchenwald who protected their children, hid over 900 of them, held illegal school for them, urged them to make plans for their futures and dream of the day that they would grow and get old and bear fruit. And you imagine what that was like in that place at that time. He rejoiced that even in the foul soil of Buchenwald, Seeds could be planted and grow and bear fruit. And what made this so interesting is that, he, is that one of the children who survived that was standing right next to him and next to the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. You know him too. His name was Eile Wiesel. Let me get this up here. You, yeah, thank you. Eile Wiesel spoke on that day too. He spoke slowly and deliberately. He spoke of his own father who died in the bunk below his when he was just a child. And he spoke about the miracle of a Jew standing next to the German Chancellor before the gates of Buchenwald. Oh, and he spoke about us too, the American people. He said, you have taken a moral vision of history a view, he prayed, that would change the world and make it a better place. He spoke of the 21st century as a century of new beginnings filled with promise and hope. Now, maybe you can dismiss that as just so much sentimental claptrap or political posturing. Maybe he thought more of us on that day than we think of ourselves. I don't know. Maybe his optimism was misplaced. It was, after all, 10 years ago, and the world's not the same. Today, our borders are being inundated by refugees, fleeing gangs and drugs and authoritarianism and crippling poverty and chasing what they think is the American dream. Today, we're at the end of a crippling pandemic, where in the space of 15 months, more Americans have died of a virus than died in all of the battles in all of the wars ever fought by America. Let that settle in for a second. We stand on a beach that's been swept clean by a storm, a tsunami of grief and helplessness and anger and fear and denial as a nation, as a people, as a church. We stand in breathless anticipation of the future, looking out in fear, wondering if the rest of the 21st century is gonna be any better than it's been so far. But I stood there before, some of you have too. Back in 1975, when the Vietnam War ran to its ugly conclusion, as the North Vietnamese Army breached the walls of our embassy in Saigon and desperate people raced for the helicopters on that roof that took off and landed on aircraft carriers and had to be shoved off the side so that there'd be space for the new helicopters to come. 
We stood there in 1982. When the Cold War heated up and the nuclear arms race seemed unstoppable. And the possibility of nuclear destruction was not just the stuff of science fiction, but the stuff of the daily news. We stood there in 1989 when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down and the whole future of Eastern Europe hung in the balance in that same year when the Balkans caught fire in places like Sarajevo and Bosnia entered into our everyday talk as common as Kansas City and Canada. We stood at those times facing that windswept beach and looked out at the future in fear and we wondered. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is just like that. Just like that moment. And if you're going to speak about heavenly things, you need to begin by speaking about earthly things. If you want to describe that which is beyond all words, you need to begin by using words we know, words like, like people, fields, seeds, bushes, sheep, because the kingdom of God is like that. It's found in such things, and if you can't see the kingdom here, you're never going to see it someplace else. Because here is where the seeds have been planted. Here is where they have been sown. Here is where we live. Here is where we stand. Delivered, as it were, to this time and this place, on that familiar strip of beach, knowing that someone, somewhere, sometime, somehow, planted the dream of a better world in our hearts, planted a seed in the soil of our souls that germinated and grew. And here we stand, pastors and deacons and teachers and coaches and parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and children and adults, a family of faith that knows a truth that sets us free. Here we stand, knowing that someone, somewhere, sometime, somehow, planted a seed of what we might believe and do and give and love, the dream of a world fairer and more just, the dream of a world kinder and more compassionate, the seed of God's kingdom on earth and our place in it. The pandemic is over. And today we, Abiding Christ Lutheran Church, stand on that beach and we look out. Do we look out in fear? I know that we wonder. We stand here, young and old, and we hear our Lord say to us, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and we would sleep and rise night and day and it would sprout and grow. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, which grows and becomes a great bush. And the birds nest in the shade of its branches. We hear it. We see it. We hope it. But most of all, we believe it. Because we are full of life. And because, as I have this on the highest authority, it is the gospel truth. To God be the glory.